Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Fritz Schroeder, and welcome to the Pollinator and Rain Garden Design Virtual Lecture as part of Lancaster Water Week 2020. We are excited to have so many of you join us to learn more about the very key role conservation landscaping and native plants play in supporting our local ecosystems and capturing and cleaning our rainwater. The Lancaster Conservancy launched Water Week four years ago as a way to bring more attention, education, action, and funding to the 1,400 miles of streams and rivers in Lancaster County. Nearly half of these waterways are impaired or polluted. As a 50-year-old land trust that owns and manages over 7,000 acres of forested lands and 47 nature preserves, we know and understand the importance of these waterways. One thing that has become abundantly clear is there are many partners and businesses that care about this very issue. And with focused attention and on the ground implementation, these impaired streams can be brought back to health in our lifetimes. Today's presentation is being recorded and will be shared with everyone who pre-registered within the next several days. We have several additional virtual lectures this week, including this evening, Faith in Action, Creation Care for Clean Water, and on Friday at noon, The Hidden World of Stream Insects. Please consider taking the Water Week pledge and take action to clean up our local streams. Our number one action step is create habitat so you are in the right place. Today's presentation will give you the background you need to continue to build out a more sustainable landscape. With your pledge, you get a free kit with additional helpful information and a free native tree or shrub. To sign up for an event and to take the pledge, please visit lancasterwaterweek.org. Finally, Water Week is only possible because of the very generous support of our sponsors. These are local organizations and businesses that are passionate about clean water. Through their generous support, we are able to host these events and they've helped us contribute over $120,000 in grants to clean water implementation in Lancaster County. Turkey Hill Dairy has been our presenting sponsor since the founding of Water Week in 2017. Today, I also wanna recognize the Campbell Foundation, Chesapeake Bay Foundation, City of Lancaster, Lakswama, Brookfield Renewable, Lancaster Clean Water Consortium, Eurofins, Stroud Water Research, Flyway Excavating, Land Studies, Landis Homes, Octoroar Native Plant Nursery, Lancaster County Conservation District, and Donegal Trout Unlimited. Each of these organizations and businesses have invested in Water Week and each has had a hand in creating or preserving critical habitat here in Lancaster and helping us move toward a more balanced and healthy ecosystem. And now I would like to welcome Kate Austin, who is the Green Infrastructure Asset Coordinator for the City of Lancaster, PA. She inspects, assesses, and coordinates, maintains practice and maintenance practices for the city's green infrastructure installations, as, a, as well as manages the Small Stormwater Project Permitting Program. Kate is passionate about cultivating multifunctional, beautiful native urban landscapes to manage stormwater, provide habitat, and promote urban greening. Kate is a graduate of the University of Georgia with a bachelor's degree in landscape architecture and Moravian College with a bachelor's degree in political science. Welcome, Kate. All right, thank you, Fritz. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we're gonna have a fun conversation about rain garden design and installation, and uh, we're gonna go a little bit beyond the basics, and we're gonna get into some of the nitty gritty details of what it takes to uh, design and install a beautiful, functional rain garden that will uh, support pollinators as well as manage stormwater on our properties. All right, so um, to start with, we're gonna talk a little bit about the basics of, um, of a rain garden. And I think many of you who are with us today know what a rain garden is. We're talking about a um, small vegetated area that's graded to be kind of a shallow depression. Think of it like a shallow bowl, um, six to 12 inches below grade at the lowest point. 
Um, these areas are densely planted with native plants that can handle some extremes. They're gonna handle being inundated with water in a rain event, as well as being dry during the majority of the time when we are not under heavy rain events. And these areas are going to drain fully. The water is going to infiltrate into the soil within 24 to 72 hours at a maximum, ideally 24 hours. So we have a multitude of benefits with rain gardens. You know, we have our native plant species that are going to be supporting our, um, our pollinators, um, our birds, and providing beauty and greening on our properties. A lot of where the action happens in terms of managing the stormwater is going to be in the root zone and the soils. And um, so we're going to have the, our nutrient uptake happening in there and also the infiltration of the volume of stormwater that we're directing. Because of that, we want to make sure that we site our rain garden at least 10 feet from any structure. And we'll talk about that more. Um, and because what we really want to create is a little ponding zone where water can collect and slowly drain into our soils so that we can be managing the stormwater that runs off of our impervious surfaces like our roofs and our sidewalks and patios um, into, uh, into our rain garden. And uh, we'll talk more about, you know, what that soil mix is going to look like in this drawing here. Uh, they do suggest that you could look at um, replacing the soils and doing a soil mixture uh, that would include sand, compost, and topsoil. Also, uh, you could also, if you already have well-draining soils, you might be just using your native soils, and that works perfectly well. Another option uh, that we'll talk a bit about is uh, you could install an underdrain, uh, basically a stone bed beneath your soils that would help to maximize the capacity. Um, and this is an option and certainly not a necessity for a rain garden design. So when we think about siting a rain garden, there's basically two, two options that we can look at. The first is directing a downspout from the house towards this vegetated area. And this, uh, we could connect our downspout into an underground pipe, as is shown in the image on the right here, that will uh, bring the stormwater that is draining from the roof of the house um, directly into the garden area. Um, otherwise, the downspout could also be um, at the surface and could just run at the surface into the rain garden, as we see in the image uh, on the left here. One of the things in either situation that we want to consider is where the water enters the garden, because this is a prime spot for some erosion. Uh, the velocity of the water entering, we want to make sure that uh, we can slow down and dissipate that energy. Um, and that's usually done through the use of plant species that are maybe a little bit tougher. Um, and uh, we're going to get into plants a little bit later, but one that works well um, is juncus. We've seen that work quite well um, because it can really hold up to the force of the water coming in. Alternatively, stone could be used to help to break up that flow and to spread it across the garden. So those are some things to think about um, at the, um, as we start thinking about design. Alternatively, if we are not directing a downspout um, directly into the garden, we could also be capturing surface runoff, say from a driveway or even from the backyard into the rain garden. So in these situations, we may have um, uh, downspouts that are discharging out, um, closer to a, uh, to a structure or we might just have uh, water that we're collecting that's running off of paved surfaces, might be coming off of a patio, driveway, um, walkways. Um, and when we think about grass, a lot of people tend to think that, you know, a grass lawn, that's gonna do a great job of collecting that stormwater runoff. But in fact, grass doesn't really do a great job at infiltration. Um, as you can imagine, the, the roots are pretty short um, in grass and the soils tend to be pretty compacted, running a mower over it all the time. Um, so we're really only looking at capturing maybe a quarter of an inch per hour. Um, and in heavy rain events, uh, you can imagine there's quite a bit of runoff that comes off there. So it's a great opportunity to install a rain garden um, at a natural grade where that surface runoff is already tending to flow or you can grade your, grade your yard so that it can actually um, 
direct and capture that water through a series of swales and berms and just a shallow depression. The one thing that you want to keep in mind is um, at uh, regardless of uh, how you're directing the water there, you don't want to install a rain garden at an existing low point that consistently holds water and doesn't infiltrate. So if you have a wet spot in your yard that is holding water for longer than 72 hours after a heavy rain event, this is not a great location for a rain garden because as you can imagine, if the water doesn't infiltrate into the ground now, it's likely not going to um, when, if, you site, if you are directing more water there and you're siting your rain garden. So you might think about some alternatives. Is there a better location uh, that is maybe upslope of this spot where you could um, install your rain garden? Um, or you could think about some soil amendments, and we'll talk about that later, um, that might help to, um, help to infiltrate that water into the soil. So as we start thinking about rain garden design, the big question is, how do I decide what size this rain garden needs to be? We want to make sure that the rain garden is sized to be able to adequately manage the full amount of runoff that is being directed to it. You don't want your rain garden to be uh, overwhelmed with water and not able to adequately infiltrate um, and uh, because otherwise it'll just end up um, kind of uh, overflowing and going into other areas. Um, and at heavy rain events that may happen, but we want to make sure in our average one inch rainstorm, which is what we tend to design for, that we have um, adequate storage both in the surface storage, so that's going to be that ponding area, so if we're looking at our low point being six to 12 inches uh, at the lowest point, we're gonna have a nice bit of, uh, of ponding area where we can capture, uh, capture water there. Additionally, we can calculate how much water is going to be draining into the soils. The soils do a great job of managing that runoff as well. So the combination of the surface storage and the soil storage is what we'll calculate in the sizing. And the type of soil that you have does affect infiltration rates. And so if you have a very heavy clay soil, rain gardens can still work certainly in clay soil, but you have to remember that it's going to infiltrate more slowly than say a sandy based soil. Um, so these rain gardens may be a bit, you might size them a bit larger. Um, and so that's something to consider. So if you have concerns about your soils not infiltrating well, one test you can do is an infiltration test. And there is very expensive equipment to do this that is typically done um, for, you know, for larger projects, but there's a really simple home test that you can do to make sure that your soil is going to be able to infiltrate and manage the water that's being directed to it. So they call it the coffee can test because surprise, surprise, you use a coffee can or you dig a hole about the same size as a coffee can. And you're gonna take the top and the bottom off the can, you're gonna fill the can with water and you're gonna wait for it to fully drain. Then we're gonna fill it up again. And the reason we do this is because we wanna know how well the soil can infiltrate water after it's already saturated because it's when it's really dry, it really is gonna suck in that water. So we wanna know what it can do, say after we've had a day of rain and um, so you're gonna fill that can again with water and you're gonna measure the depth with a ruler of how much water that you, um, that you put in there. And then you're gonna time how long it takes to drain, pretty simple. So um, after four hours, you're gonna go back and you're gonna measure with your ruler and see how much water has drained. And, um, and so that number of inches over four hours, you're gonna multiply those inches times six because then we'll get to how many inches in 24 hours. Um, and so you want to be, ideally, you want to be give, able to capture that one inch rain event. Uh, if you capture more than that, that's fantastic. That means that your rain garden is going to drain faster. Um, and so if you have very, very rapid um, infiltration rates, that might be um, something to look at. Um, you know, you want to make sure there's nothing underground that might be happening, but typically in our backyard um, conditions, um, we're going to have kind of a nice steady slow infiltration rate that's going to allow that water to uh, to drain in evenly 
and drain within that 24 hours. If it doesn't drain and you aren't getting at least one inch um, um, over 24 hours, then uh, you might consider locating your rain garden in a different place in your yard. Or you might think about doing that stone uh, bed beneath the soil that we saw in that first image that would give you a little bit more capacity. And so that would, the stone would be another reservoir for, uh, for the water storage. Additionally, you could think about amending your soils um, with uh, gravel, compost, or sand. Um, one thing to consider um, with native plant species is uh, you don't want to go overboard with the compost because a lot of our native species tend to like a little bit of a leaner soil. So some compost for improving soil health is great, um, but um, you don't want to be um, adding a lot of amendments that's going to be make it very nutrient heavy because your plants are going to tend to flop um, and uh, it's uh, not going to be contributing to the water quality benefits. We want to be reducing the amount of nutrients that's going back into our groundwater. Um, so basically, we just want to let nature take its course. That's really what we're replicating here. So now you have an idea vaguely where you want to put your rain garden. You've got, you've done your infiltration test. You know your soils drain well. Great. So the next thing you want to do is calculate the surface area on your property that's going to be draining into this rain garden. And so, for example, if you are looking to um, capture a downspout into your rain garden, we can look at this example of this house here. So we're going to look at the total square footage of the whole roof rooftop, but the downspout is only managing a quarter of that roof. So we'll, let's assume there's four downspouts on each, there's one on each corner of the roof. So um, the quarter that we are going to be managing is 450 square feet. And so we know that that is the volume, that is the area of water that is draining into our rain garden. And that's a key number for helping us size this. So you can also look at this in calculating, um, this is going to be the same process for calculating the area of say your driveway or a patio or a walkway you're going to want to get that square footage number. So then we're going to take that square footage that's draining into our rain garden. And here's where we're going to figure out how much total volume of stormwater we're, that we need to manage in our rain garden. So I use this as an example. Let's say we have a 400 square foot um, roof area. And we are then going to multiply that by 0 0.083 and that represents that one inch rain event. So it's one inch times one foot divided by 12 inches. And so that's where we get that number. So you're gonna multiply that through and you'll get your cubic footage of water that needs to be managed. And just to give you an idea, I am pulling, uh, this table is actually straight from the city of Lancaster's small stormwater permit application. And uh, so this is a great resource. If you are applying to do a rain garden in your yard in the city, this is the application that you're gonna use. And if you're not in the city, you could, you're more than welcome to go onto our website, grab that um, application because you'll have that calculator there to help you size your rain garden. Um, on your property. So we're going to get that cubic footage of water that we need to manage. And then we're going to come over to the table that helps us to actually size this rain garden. So this is where we get into a little combination of kind of art and science in uh, figuring out the size here. So like we talked about before, you're going to be looking at capturing both your, uh, your surface uh, capture area, and that's going to be that ponding depth, and the soil. So we'll start with the surface area. So I was estimating that the low point of my rain garden is, uh, is six inches. But as you can imagine, uh, we've got these sloping sides. It's, it's not going to be six inches deep throughout the entire rain garden. And so, um, so I'm estimating that on average, I've got about four inches of ponding. And that's where we're kind of, uh, that's kind of the art side of it. You're going to do kind of an estimate there of uh, what you, uh, what the way that you're designing it, what it's going to look like. So I'm going to say on average, it's about four inches. 
Um, so, and I'm making my rain garden 12 feet long by eight feet wide. And then I'm times four inches deep. That's gonna be that ponding depth. And then I'm gonna multiply that times a void ratio of one because there is nothing, there's nothing to, uh, that's interfering with the, with the water being in there. We get um, a total of one um, for the, the storage capacity in that area. So 12 times eight times 0.33 times one it's going to give us 31.7 cubic feet of storage. And that's where the majority of our storage is going to come from in a rain garden, is that ponding depth. Then we're going to take a look at our soils, because our soils can also be managing um, stormwater as it, as it infiltrates through. Um, but the difference here is we're going to be looking at um, a void ratio of 0.2 because that is um, the space between the, the pore space between the soil particles that the water is gonna be able to drain into. So that's the number that we use as, as a standard in the city for calculating soil storage. So again, I'm gonna say that my rain garden is 12 feet long by eight feet wide. Um, and I'm gonna estimate that the rain is, the water is gonna be infiltrating into that first six inches. So um, times 0.5 then times that 0.2. So that's gonna give me another 9.6 cubic feet of storage. And in total, I'll have 34 cubic feet. And so we needed, I think 33.2 is what we uh, estimated our volume that we needed to be able to manage. So we've got a little more than that, which is perfect. Um, so uh, that's, that's the calculation of how we're gonna size it. So once you have figured out all the math and uh, then you can actually sit down to the fun part of designing your rain garden and figuring out what it's gonna look like. Now, um, when you create your plan, you can draw this by hand, you can do it on a computer. Um, you, it's best if you can draw it to scale because then you get an idea of how many plants you're gonna need in your rain garden for that dense planting. Um, but you wanna include dimensions either way. Um, so you're going to lay all of that out, figure out your plant species that you want to include in there. Um, and there's lots of great ideas. Um, so you're going to be, uh, you know, thinking about different species, um, whether you're in full sun or shade, um, all kinds of different conditions. And Elise will talk more about that later. Um, so if you are in a municipality like the city of Lancaster that requires a stormwater permit for this type of work, you're gonna submit your plan and your application for any necessary permits that you need. Then you actually get to the fun stuff of installing your garden. So you're gonna start out with excavation and grading. So you might start with some spray paint to just kind of spray out the area that you're looking to um, install for your rain garden. And you can do the excavation then of kind of creating that shallow bowl shape either by hand with shovels, ideally with a large group of kids who do a great job of uh, digging out turf grass. This was at Wheatland Middle School several years ago. Um, or this can be done with machinery. One thing I'll note that if you are using um, a backhoe or other machinery to excavate out your soils, you want to make sure that you don't drive that machinery over the bed of your rain garden because what you'll end up doing is compacting those soils and limiting the ability for water to infiltrate. So you really want to be protective of those soils as soon as you do the excavation because that is really where um, where the real work is going to happen um, for the rain garden. Then you get into the fun stuff, planting. So um, you're going to look at uh, planting densely um, and layering plants of different heights, um, looking at ground cover species and then taller species. Um, here in the city, we really like to use plugs as our planting material because they're small and have nice healthy root systems. And once they are installed, they tend to take off really quickly. Um, and so, um, so yeah, we lay them out and then uh, work together in a team to get them all installed. And so um, we look at, usually we're uh, planting our plugs about 12 inches on center. Um, and um, so, um, so yeah, so that is, um, that's 
something that you can work off of. If you're using larger plant material, you're going to um, go a little bit um, further apart than that, um, but that tends to work well and creates a nice dense planting zone. I'd be remiss not to talk a little bit about maintenance. Um, so one thing, you want to make sure that you are watering regularly when you first install your rain garden. I mean, it seems a little counterintuitive. This is a garden that's designed to, uh, to manage water. That doesn't mean that those young plants don't need a lot of water upon establishment to get those roots, uh, to get those root zones going. Uh, in the first few years, you're also going to look at um, regular weeding, and that's going to be something ongoing, but there'll be reduced frequency as those plants kind of grow and fill out. You want to keep an eye out for any areas of erosion, especially where the flow path of the water might be kind of digging out your soils, and you'll want to uh, repair those areas and maybe install some, uh, some tougher plants that can kind of help intercept that, or maybe install some stone in areas where uh, you might be dealing with erosion. You want to remove any sediment or debris and replace plants as, as necessary. Um, you will find that you know the plants will kind of work themselves out where they're happy and spread as they are. Um, so that's uh, that'll be um, something to kind of watch as the garden matures, um, what it ends up, what shape it ends up taking. And that's about it. And so as far as the design and uh, the calculations uh, for rain gardens. So I want to thank you all for your time here today. Um, and if you have any questions, feel free to contact me at the city. Um, and you can always get more information both at uh, the City of Lancaster PA website um, or at Save It Lancaster, where we have lots of great resources for uh, green infrastructure projects for residents and property owners everywhere. Thank you so much and happy Water Week. Thank you so much, Kate. A wealth of information and we truly appreciate the skills that you bring to our community. Now it's my pleasure to welcome Elise Jurgen. Elise is the owner of Waxwing EcoWorks. She is a community collaborator working to rebuild ecological literacy and biodiversity through hands-on ecological gardening experiences in Lancaster and York County, Pennsylvania. She is certified as a Chesapeake Bay landscape professional, an ecological permaculture designer, along with earning an ecological gardening cer certification from Mount Cuba Center. In addition to her ecological design skills, she has a master's degree in environmental education. Welcome, Elise. zoomed out. Okay, and sharing my screen. All right. So thank you so much, Fritz, for the introduction and the opportunity to um, share with the Lancaster Conservancy community today during Water Week. I'll be tag teaming with Kate's presentation to share resources and a brief overview of ecologically valuable plants for your next garden project, whether it is a rain garden project or conversion of lawn, or maybe you're looking to um, convert an existing landscape bed. So let's make sure that is, whoops. Having, there we go, okay. So this image is quite a common occurrence in suburban and rural Lancaster County. There's so much opportunity in our county to reinvent our spaces into lush habitat and places that recharge the water table as Kate has mentioned rather than cheating off storm water and discouraging life to thrive. Turf grass, um, Kate mentioned this, is on the far left here and has very shallow roots that provide minimal function in our landscapes. Um, but on the other hand, native plants that compose our more wild spaces and that we're able to select um, to plant in our home landscapes dig their roots down deep and slurp up all that storm water while also supporting um, a diversity of wildlife. 
Uh, the use of ecologically valuable native plants in our landscapes is crucial in rebounding vital pollinator populations. Given that the land in the U.S. is over 80% owned by private own owners like homeowners like us, and so we become a vital part of that solution. So here you can see a little um, monarch caterpillar, and these insects have co-evolved with native plants, like the classic example shown here, where the monarch needs to munch on milkweed. And we're able to grow insect nurseries for bees and butterflies that not only fuel the rest of, food, of the food webs, but um, also are pollinating a third of every bite of food we take. So we really need to rethink what our backyards look like. Our land-based decisions also impact the health of aquatic ecosystems. Here are two stoneflies in Trout Run, which is the stream that I volunteer monitor. And um, their well-being is based on the decisions that farmers and homeowners make on land in that watershed. So again, our choices on land impact water ecosystems. And terrestrial and aquatic ecosystem food webs are very much linked. The plants that we choose to integrate in our home landscape um, are all the base of all food webs and are critical in supporting the well-being of both land and water ecosystems as shown here. And when we start integrating these ecologically vital plants into our spaces, we open up the door for a multitude of ecosystem services to take shape. I love this wheel because it just shows you by just putting some plants in the ground, all the services that you can provide, flood control, habitat formation, pollinator services, education, um, provisioning resources, so gathering food and fiber from our gardens, and simply enjoying just the aesthetic beauty of our spaces. So reimagining kind of that swath of grass that we showed at the beginning, here are some vegetative solutions for converting lawns into more highly functional spaces. Um, the first being conservation landscapes, where you're just basically taking kind of a customary garden bed, but designing it using those ecologically valuable plants. And then as Kate wonderfully mentioned, the, rain, the benefits of rain gardens, they can be positioned further away from the foundation and even um, provide further function by capturing and managing stormwater. So if you live in the city, rain gardens are your lowest cost solution to offset some of that stormwater footprint that you have. However, if you're simply looking to convert some grass um, or looking to convert an existing um, landscape bed, you can make highly beneficial habitat gardens, um, which is mentioned here as conservation landscaping. And they serve greatly actually in mitigating rainwater as well, and also are a little bit more affordable if you're not looking for something that is, is, is intensive a process. So let's dive in a little into conservation landscaping. Here you see um, there is uh, just a front yard landscape and actually is capturing a little bit of water, just a small section of roof. So you can have like an overflow from your rain barrel or maybe just the downspout um, being detached. You don't have to do any really fancy calculations for this, but again, instead of having turf grass, you're using that space to put in deep roots that can um, support habitat and also help to um, capture stormwater. Here are some of the plants in that particular landscape. Um, we have Pacra, which is a great ground cover and, and um, enjoys more wet conditions. Swamp milkweed is a species of milkweed that enjoys its feet a little more wet, but also can handle average soils. Liatris and Echinacea. These are plants that can um, be um, integrated into some of your conventional landscapes, but also be integrated into rain gardens as well. Um, Kate briefly mentioned this, if there's an area in your yard that is not suitable for a rain garden, that the water is more stagnant, a wet meadow may be more appropriate for this site. So um, there are plenty of plants that would actually enjoy having a prolonged kind of soil saturation. And so there's still opportunity to use that space um, as habitat as well. 
here's some species in a little wet meadow project that I worked on. So turtlehead works well there, Monarda didima, which is a hummingbird favorite, some mountain mint, and joe pie weed. These also happen to be okay in rain garden designs as well. Um, but these particularly would be more appropriate for more that pooling area where the rain garden is slightly more wet over time. If you decide, however, um, that a rain garden is a better fit, first take into consideration all those calculations that Kate went over um, and make sure that you're sizing the, the space appropriately. Um, they will be designed with a deeper depression so they can actually hold on to um, more rainwater and have that recharge the water table. Here you'll see there's three planting zones. The first one being kind of where the water will have higher inundations and then zone three where the soils are more dry. So again, planting species within those areas that are best suited for that. And I'll provide some further research um, and resources for you if you want to dive into this a little deeper. Um, we'll just start touching upon it a little bit today. Uh, I love this image. This was from um, actually the Conservancy's website. And you can see here that um, they have red twig dogwood in that bottom zone and then a lot of seasonal themes but that green shade is actually ground covers and we're going to go over that this is vital because again with kind of um, a lot of conventional landscaping that you see you see the use of a lot of wood mulch but in the use of ecological gardens you're going to replace that wood mulch with um, ground covers. It's actually going to be about 50% of your planting. So here they're using valuable sedges and pacra um, to seal everything together and to create a lovely mosaic of plants. So say you go ahead and you do all the calculations that either Kate went over and you know that you need 75 square feet of rain garden or maybe you're looking just to convert 75 square feet of lawn in your backyard or maybe there's an existing bed that you have. They just don't look like the look of it. It's not serving ecosystem, a lot of ecosystem services. What on earth do you do um, after you have a number that you can work with? This is um, briefly the process that I use. It's very fluid and very flexible, um, but it just gives you kind of a template um, to work with. So uh, number one for sure is gathering those details of your project. What are your limitations? What permits do you have? Um, do you have a sp specific budget? Do you have a timeline? What are your goals for that? What are your calculations? And you wanna write all that down. Then make sure that you have um, analyzed that site. Um, I do this process with students in schoolyards and they're going out looking at you know, circulation of the space sun exposure, um, what is um, the hydrology, how is water flowing in that space, how is the soil um, percolating in that space as Kate mentioned. So this is a vital piece to gather all that information to kind of really discern um, what plant species would be best there and where they best would be located. You're going to design this out to scale if possible and really mark out you know, where, if you're doing a rain garden, where can you start actually um, having that water start percolating from the foundation, giving yourself that 10 foot clearance. So making it to scale, again, helps for you to determine how many plants you need, given that we're gonna be planting densely about every 10 to 12 inches. So you can imagine if it's, you know, 75 square feet, you're gonna need at least 75 plants to fill that space. And when you start thinking of plants, there's plenty of wonderful resources out here. Um, I have this book mentioned at the end, um, so you can jot it down at the end. This is from Catherine Zimmerman, her book, Urban and Suburban Meadows. And she has a section in her book which really um, beautifully shows the right plant, right place concept, where it will spell out what site conditions the plant enjoys whether you're you know, designing a dry meadow or a wet meadow, um, this would be an excellent resource if you prefer um, book resources. Another book that I highly recommend is Planting in a Post-Wild World by Thomas Rainier and Claudia West. And we're gonna dig into this just a little bit more um, with understanding how to design pollinator and rain gardens. 
they do a wonderful job explaining how gardens should be broken down into three layers, ground cover, seasonal themes, and structural plants. And it really helps you just understand the anatomy of a garden and really helps to um, change your perspective of your landscape, but breaks it down into simple steps so that you can be a designer in your own backyard. So that first layer is the ground cover layer. And as I mentioned previously, that's about 50%. I know that number's staggering, but the majority of your garden should be um, ground covers. And again, that is replacing all that mulch that you're, you might be seeing as you look out your window. Um, this is a living layer that really seals everything together and is vital for the health and well-being of that landscape. Um, you'll see here on the left, um, there are a few species. Um, the heath aster, definitely a wonderful ground cover, but is for sure more of a dry loving species. Whereas the Paca aurorio that can handle some shade actually prefers more moist conditions. Um, there's a variety of sedges that are available um, in the market that are also wonderful ground covers as well. Um, so it really just depends on your site conditions and your particular project. This just gives you a sneak little peek into a few that I use. And then the seasonal theme, this is going to be about 20 to 40 percent of your designed garden. So it might change depending upon um, what kind of landscape you're trying to mimic as nature does. The first column plants can handle more wet conditions like those found in a rain garden and happen to also be wonderful selections for average soils as well. Um, for um, like a sunny conservation landscape garden bed. Turtle head and blue flag iris are also selections that are great for rain gardens, but can be um, integrated into um, landscapes as well if, if, the if the soil stays more moist in that area. And they happen to also be able to tolerate some shade. So if you have some tree coverage that's competing with some sun, there's still opportunity um, for some wonderful landscapes. And then moving on to that, the more structural layer, it's actually only about 10 to 15 percent of your landscape. So those are tend to be more of the woody plants, shrubs and trees, but also structural grasses like switchgrass would also be categorized in this layer. And again, um, there's the red twig dogwood that was in the conservancy's design, um, but there are other plants like inkberry and spice bush that would be adequate for more um, shade types of um, site conditions. And when you're picking that plant palette, it may seem funny, um, but you first want to look to see what is available before you start having fun designing. Um, are you sourcing wholesale plants with your landscaper or are you doing a DIY project um, and finding native plants through a retail provider? Uh, there is a Penn State Extension has a wonderful list of um, native plant sources that do not use neonicotinoids, which is a harmful chemical that is used um, pretty regularly in the nursery trade. So um, I'm going to make sure the Conservancy, I believe, has that. We can send that to you to make sure that you are sourcing your plants um, from a reliable um, nursery. And then what I like to do sometimes is take that list and then create a spreadsheet so that you can see when the bloom times are, so you see that you're having crossovers and your bloom cycles um, to so not only support the ecosystem function of aesthetics, but also for pollinator support. Your um, backyard will literally become an ecosystem, not just for passersby and visitors, but literally supporting populations of vital insects if you keep that pollination or that bloom cycle um, continual. And then um, you are then ready to site prep that space, that 75 square feet you have or whatever square footage you're looking to convert. It might be appropriate to use sheet mulching, which is using layers of cardboard, cardboard and then wood chips on top. Um, as Kate mentioned, it might need, in, in the case of a rain guard, you may need to actually have some excavation equipment to actually um, create that that depression in the land. So whatever your site prep method is, you can then start thinking about um, getting that site ready and then having the fun of planting that space densely every 10 to 12 inches for rapid soil coverage. So you only will need to use wood mulch in the beginning stages of the planting. 
Um, and then this, the plants will seal together and just create a wonderful green matrix for you to enjoy. Um, so no more wood mulching after the first install. And then you can um, definitely design a lower management garden, and Kate mentioned this too, but maintenance is critical for all gardens, especially in those vital first two years where there could be some competing um, weed species that you wanna monitor. Um, but it's also just a wonderful time to go observe the visitors of your garden um, and to see the changes that the garden is making over time. So, I am a big fan of embracing the management instead of fearing it. This can be a wonderful opportunity educationally and just enjoying the aesthetic beauty. And so as promised here, a few resources for you to further explore the bottom two books I mentioned, Urban Suburban Meadows, um, Planting in a Post Wild World is a, just a great book, not necessarily on rain garden design, but just understanding the anatomy um, of a garden um, kind of reading it like a science book. That top book there, Heather Holm, is a great resource for folks that are looking to dive in more into pollinator insect interactions. Um, she also includes lovely um, photos in that um, book as well. So those are three wonderful sources that I keep on my bookshelf. And then particularly for rain garden design, here's some resources. They actually have some DIY design tools in here as well um, that you can further explore. Penn State has a list of rain garden plants divided into those three zones um, that we briefly mentioned that could be an excellent resource. And of course, the Conservancy has, as part of their Community Wildlife Habitat initiative, has also other ample resources um, for you to freely use. And again, thank you so much for your participation in Water Week and your willingness to take action in rebuilding biodiversity and managing more rainwater on your home landscape. Feel free to contact me um, at my email there, or give me a call if you wanna collaborate on a project. And thanks again for taking action um, this week and continually. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Elise um, and Kate. Those presentations were incredibly informative and I'm sure we're going to have a lot of questions. If you do have questions for Elise and Kate, please use that Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. We will try to get to as many questions as possible. Again, we will make this presentation available to anyone who pre-registered um, and we'll make sure we link to some of those great resources that Elise mentioned as well, as well as Kate. Um, while we wait for you to start putting those questions in the Q&A box, I want to remind you to take the Lancaster Water Week pledge. There are three simple action steps we each can take to make sure we have clean streams and rivers, the first of which is to create habitat. We have three more pledge pickup locations this week where you can get your own free tree or native shrub um, that you can start to uh, incorporate into your landscaping. We also have a reusable tote bag stuffed with educational materials and some fun things from our partners as well. We have two more online lectures this week. Tonight, Faith in Action, Creation Care for Clean Water will be at 7 p.m. We encourage you to join us to learn more about some of the green infrastructure projects happening at interfaith locations throughout our community. And we have The Hidden World of Stream Insects Friday at noon with incredible photography from Stroud Research Center. We'd also like to remind you to take part in the 2020 Conestoga Plus Cleanup. This year with safety top of mind and our regular volunteer group gatherings on pause, we are encouraging individuals to take action to protect water on their own. So what's that plus in Conestoga plus cleanup? While we love the Conestoga, there are a lot of cricks and creeks in our community that need some love and a lot less litter. So we encourage you to pick up trash at your local stream or your favorite park or preserve um, and to keep that trash from polluting our waterways. To participate, it's very simple. You just go onto our website and click that cleanup survey button. You'll enter some few simple questions and your cleanup will appear on our cleanup map. So now let's see if we have some Q&As here. And again, all of those resources, our lectures, the pledge, and the Conestoga cleanup are at lancasterwaterweek.org. Um, and we'll make sure we post that in the comments there. So first question we have here is, what are some other shade loving ground covers that, that will work instead of conventional mulch? Um, 
and Kate, feel free to, Kate's also a Garnet Designs as well. Um, some that I use for the shade, I do like to use Heuchera, um, Sun Drops, the Enothera Fruticosa can handle both sun and shade and has like um, an evergreen basil rosette that is nice. Um, Pacura, if you're looking for something that's a little more hardy and can really cover a, a large space, Pacura Aurora um, can be um, a nice um, selection. Um, and it's great for um, erosion control and it again is evergreen, so it's nice for the winter time. Um, there are plenty of um, shade loving sedges that I absolutely love to use. Um, there's Carex um, Pennsylvanica, Carex Avalachica, um, all these fun scientific names. Um, they are just, they, they might look um, a little bit more muted in the landscape. They're just, um, they don't provide as much flowering, but are vital to replace that wood mulch. So there's a few that I use, but there are ample others. Um, and I didn't mention um, an online retail place that is definitely growing right now is isoplants.com. And they're, they're a great resource too that you can kind of put in your site conditions and they'll pop up species that um, would be amazing for the, your space, but also available for you to access on your own if you're doing a DIY project. So Izel, I-Z-E-L plants, um, it's definitely a great place to get those landscape plugs that Kate mentioned and can help you in that searching process to find things that are shade loving and are also shorter for ground covers. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, Marcy has a question. If there is a median in the city that we would like to convert to meadow or wildflowers, does the city have any information on steps we could um, take to make this happen? Absolutely, yes. So if it's a median in the city, then that is going to be in the public right of way. And so that would be something that um, you would want to, uh, you can contact me um, because that will be a Department of Public Works project and we would be happy to partner and take a look and you know see what the opportunities are. Um, and uh, I, you might see some examples of some um, on Liberty Street. We planted median there, um, uh, and uh, and it does quite well. And so I think that it's a good model we could uh, think about, um, but think about different species that we might use um, in some other areas. So please reach out. That's exciting. And we'll make sure that your information is in the email we'll send out afterwards with this recording. Great. Um, we have another question. Must you excavate a natural basin and install sub-drainage materials, or can you just remove the lawn segment and plant and dress the area? You absolutely do not need to do an underdrain system. Um, and um, so where an underdrain system is going to be beneficial, and that's going to be excavating out your soils and putting in that stone bed, is if you have um, a limited area in your yard to uh, install your rain garden in and the ponding storage and the soil storage themselves is not enough for the volume of the roof runoff, um, for instance, um, or driveway runoff or whatever it might be. So that's where that's going to be beneficial. So, um, you know, so in the city where we have our curbside rain gardens, those are all under drained with those that stone bed because they're managing a very large volume of water coming off of the roadway. That is typically not going to be necessary in a backyard or a front yard rain garden. And so, um, but it's, it's an option to kind of amplify the amount of volume that you can capture. We have an anonymous question now. All right. <laughs> I absolutely hate to weed. Is a water rain garden pollinator garden out of my future? <laughs> I will say that there is no such thing as a maintenance-free garden. However, um, when you are planting at the density that we're talking about here, you know, um, 12 inches on center or 10 inches on center, once your plants get established, you're going to have much less of a need for weeding. Um, I'm not gonna say you're not gonna have a need for weeding because weeds find a way, but, um, but it is certainly um, a possibility. If you are looking for a totally maintenance-free stormwater solution, um, 
a rain garden might not be your best bet. You might think about something like a dry well that's going to be a subsurface stone bed. Um, so that might be um, something to consider if it's really a spot that you're just not going to get out to. Um, but, um, but I would say a rain garden, it's going to be less weeding and maintenance than say um, a garden bed that you're uh, where the plants are spread out with uh, mulch in between. Um, as Elise uh, suggested, uh, you're really only gonna look at needing to mulch maybe in the first season to try to keep those weeds down as the plants spread. Um, so, um, but yeah, not weed free, but close. <laughs> I second that. <laughs> uh, we have a question from Harry. He wants to know your favorite native plant for color that should be included in a rain garden. He wants to know each of your answers. Ooh. So I'm a big fan of thinking about color throughout the seasons. And um, so we use, um, um, I really like when we install wild columbine for early season uh, spring color. Um, they just have really gorgeous blooms on them. Um, and um, uh, then kind of going through um, you know, the, the golden ragwort gets those great yellow flowers on them. Um, and some wild violets can be really great for that as well in the early, um, in the earlier spring and uh, great for the bees. Um, then there's, you know, there's no shortage of the summer flowering um, uh, species, but, um, but I'm really partial to the, uh, so milkweed, I would say, is probably my favorite in the summer. Um, butterfly weed in particular, the um, Asclepias tuberosa with those bright orange flowers um, is a big favorite of mine. Um, and, um, and then into the fall, um, the uh, New York asters, the deep purple of the asters, I'm really, I really love. Elise, what do you think? What do you love? <laughs> <laughs> I know. It's so I, I didn't hear the qu the question actually. Was it favorite plants? Favorite plants for color. Um, for color. I'm always a deep fan. I love just like the deep purples because it complements, you know, green so well. Um, but I don't know. I, I, as Keith said, it's kind of hard to just pick a color. Um, but yes, I think a wide range of color and also thinking about wide range of um, flower structures is also important, which we didn't go into today. I just absolutely love going to my yard and looking at the flowers that have more rays versus, you know, uh, something that a bumblebee can only access. It's just so much fun to see which species are um, gravitate towards which plants, um, but it really just shows that not only color is important for our own interests in pollinators, but also different flower shapes. Um, one last question here. Um, what resources might be available to city residents um, who are looking to install uh, one of these projects, like a rain garden? Yeah, um, so the city currently has a residential stormwater grant program that's available. So if you are a city resident and you're interested in putting any kind of stormwater project um, uh, in your on your property. So um, the grant will cover things like um, infiltration trenches, um, dry wells, rain gardens, um, uh, porous paver installations, um, the stone base underneath your porous pavers that is. Um, and um, so those sorts of projects. And uh, the grant is really aimed at projects that go above and beyond what's required by the ordinance. So um, if you're putting in a new patio and you have to do a stormwater project um, uh, for your uh, stormwater application, the grant won't cover that. But if you're putting in a new patio and you're gonna manage the, uh, the roof runoff from your property in addition to your new patio, you absolutely would qualify for the grant. So I really encourage um, uh, folks to apply um, and I'm happy to come out to your property and you know we can do a walkthrough and look at what some options might be to kind of get you started and then be able to reach out to local professionals who would be interested um, in helping you to uh, carry that project after fruition. So um, yeah, please, uh, please contact me. Thank you so much, Kate. And thank you, Elise. We really appreciate you taking the time to answer these questions. I apologize to anyone 
who didn't get their question answered today, we'll make sure that all the resources that Kate and Elise talked about are in the email that we will send um, after this presentation. I would now like to welcome back Fritz Schroeder to say a few final words as we wrap up today's online lecture. Thanks, Kelly. Kate provided many technical details you need to you need to know to create a rain garden and Elise shared many native plant types that will work in those rain gardens. Not only are you capturing and infiltrating water before it hits the municipal storm drain system, you are also providing necessary habitat for neighborhood birds, bees, butterflies, and other insects. A simple rain garden constructed by your hands will have multiple positive and lasting benefits. I think of the caterpillars on my butterfly weed, the many swallowtails residing on my joe pie weed, and the hummingbird that visits my red cardinal flower. I think of Lancaster City and its postage stamp yards filled with many small rain pollinator gardens. I think of driving through the suburbs of Lancaster County and seeing all those manicured front lawns converted with simple, low maintenance, high impact gardens that help transform our community. It's happening in large part because of professionals like Kate and Elise. I also wanna draw your attention to an initiative of Lancaster Conservancy called Community Wildlife Habitat where trained volunteers will come to your property and provide free advice on your existing landscape, identify the non-native and invasive plants, recommend high impact native substitutes. You can visit lancasterconservancy.org and click on the Community Wildlife Habitat page to learn more and schedule an appointment. With that, I wanna thank Kate and Elise for your presentation and your leadership in this field. And I wanna thank everyone in attendance have a wonderful afternoon.